Numbers don't lie. 71 things you need to know about the world. Third part. Is life expectancy finally topping out? Ray Kurzweil, Google's chief futurist, says that if you can just hang on until 2029, medical advances will start to add one additional year, every year, to your life expectancy. By that I don't mean life expectancy based on your birth date, but rather your remaining life expectancy. Curious readers can calculate what this trend would do to the growth of the global population, but I will limit myself here to a brief review of survival realities. In 1850, the combined life expectancies of men and women stood at around 40 years in the United States, Canada, Japan, and much of Europe. Since then, the values have followed an impressive and almost perfectly linear increase that saw them nearly double. Women live longer in all societies, with the current, maximum at just above 87 years in Japan. The trend may well continue for a few decades, given that from 1950 to 2000 the life expectancies of elderly people in affluent countries rose at about 34 days per year. But without fundamental discoveries that change the way we age, this trend to longer life must weaken and finally end. The long-term trajectory of Japanese female life expectancy, which increased from 81.91 years in 1990 to 87.26 years in 2017, fits a symmetrical logistic curve that is already close to its asymptote of about 90 years. The trajectories for other affluent countries also show the approaching ceiling. Records available for the 20th century show two distinct periods of rising longevity, faster linear gains, about 20 years in half a century prevailed until 1950, followed by slower gains. If we are still far from the limit to the human lifespan, then the largest survival gains should be recorded among the oldest people, that is, 80 to 85 year olds should be gaining more than those who are 70 to 75 years old. This was indeed the case for studies conducted in France, Japan, the United States, and the United Kingdom from the 1970s to the early 1990s. Since then, however, the gains have leveled off. There may be no specific genetically programmed limit to lifespan, much as there is no genetic program that limits us to a specific running speed, see how sweating improved tonding, p. 28. But lifespan is a bodily characteristic that arises from the interaction of genes with the environment. Genes may themselves introduce biophysical limits, and so can, environmental effects such as smoking. The world record lifespan is the 122 years claimed for Jean Comment, a French woman who died in 1997. Strangely, after more than two decades, she still remains the oldest survivor ever, and by a substantial margin. Indeed, the margin is so big as to be suspicious, her age and even her identity are in question, the second oldest supercentenarian died at, 119, in 1999 and since that time there have been no survivors beyond the 117th year. And if you think that you have a high chance to make it to 100 because some of your ancestors lived that long, you should know that the estimated heritability of lifespan is modest, between 15 and 30 percent. Given that people tend to marry others like themselves, a phenomenon known as a saw auditive mating, the true, heritability of human longevity is probably even lower than that. Of course, as with all complex matters, there is always room for different interpretations of published statistical analyses. Gers, while hopes that dietary interventions and other tricks will extend his own life until major scientific advances can preserve him forever. It is true that there are ideas on how such preservation might be achieved, among them the rejuvenation of human cells by extending their telomeres, the nucleotide sequences at the ends of a chromosome that fray with age. If it works, maybe it can lift the realistic maximum to well above 125 years. But for now, the best advice I can give to all but a few remarkably precocious readers is to plan ahead, though perhaps not as far ahead as the 22nd century. How, sweating improved hunting before the development of long-range projectile weaponry some tens of thousands of years ago in Africa, our ancestors had only two ways to secure meat by scavenging the leftovers of mightier beasts or by running down their own prey. 
humans were able to occupy the second of those ecological niches thanks, in part, to two great advantages of bipedalism. The first advantage, is in how we breathe. A quadruped can take only a single breath per locomotive cycle, because its chest must absorb the impact on the front limbs. We, however, can choose other ratios, and that lets us use energy more flexibly. The second, and greater, advantage is in our extraordinary ability to regulate our body temperature, which allows us to do what lions cannot, run long and hard in the, noonday sun. Microscopic section of human acrine glands it all comes down to sweating. The two large animals we have mainly used for transport perspire profusely compared to other quadrupeds, in one hour, a horse can lose about 100 grams of water per square meter of skin, and a camel can lose up to 250 grams slash m2. However, a human being can easily shed 500 grams slash m2, enough to remove between 550 and 600 watts worth of heat. Peak hourly sweating rates can surpass 2 kilograms per square meter, and the highest reported short-term sweating rate is twice that high. We are the superstars of sweating, and we need to be. An amateur running the marathon at a slow pace will consume energy at a rate of 700 to 800 watts, and an experienced marathoner who covers the 42.2 kilometers in 2.5 hours will metabolize, at a rate of about 1,300 watts. And we have another advantage when we lose water, we don't have to make up the deficit instantly. Humans can tolerate considerable temporary dehydration providing that we rehydrate in a day or so. In fact, the best marathon runners drink only about 200 milliliters per hour during a race. Together, these advantages allowed our ancestors to become unrivaled as a, diurnal, high temperature predator. They could not outsprint an antelope, of course, but during a hot day they could dog its heels until it finally collapsed, exhausted. Documented cases of such long-distance chases come from three continents and include some of the fleetest quadrupeds. In North America, the Tarahumara of northwestern Mexico could outrun deer. Further north, Peutes and Navajos, could exhaust pronghorns. In South Africa, Gulahari Bazaar ran down a variety of antelopes and even wildebeests and zebras during the dry season. In Australia, some aborigines would outrun kangaroos. These runners would even have had an advantage over the modern runners using expensive athletic shoes, their barefoot running not only reduced their energy costs by about 4%, a non-trivial advantage on long runs, it also exposed them to fewer acute ankle and lower leg injuries. In the race of life, we humans are neither the fastest nor the most efficient. But thanks to our sweating capability, we are certainly the most persistent. How many people did it take to build the Great Pyramid? Given the time elapsed since the completion of Khufu's Great Pyramid, nearly 4,600 years, the structure, albeit stripped of the smooth white limestone cladding that made it shine from afar, stands remarkably intact, and hence there is no argument about its exact shape, a polyhedron with regular polygon base, its original height. 146.6 meters including the lost pyramidion or capstone, and volume, about 2.6 million cubic meters. However, we may never know how it was built, because every, common explanation is problematic. A single long ramp would have required an enormous amount of material to construct, and moving stones up shorter, wraparound ramps would have been tricky, as would lifting and jacking up more than 2 million stones into position. But just because we do not know how it was erected does not mean that we cannot say with some confidence how many people were required to build it. The Great Pyramids of Giza We must start with the time constraint of two decades. The length of Khufu's reign, he died around 2530 BCE. Herodotus, writing more than 21 centuries after the pyramid's completion, was told during his visit to Egypt that labor gangs totaling 100,000 men at a time worked in three-month spells to finish the structure. In 1974, Kurt Mendelssohn, a German-born, British physicist, put the labor force at 70,000 seasonal workers and up to 10,000 permanent masons. But these are large overestimates, and we can come close to the real number by resorting to inescapable physics. The Great Pyramid's Potential Energy 
what is required to lift the mass above ground level, is about 2.4 trillion joules. Calculating this is fairly easy, it is simply the product of the acceleration due to gravity, the pyramid's mass, and its center of mass, a quarter of its height. Though the mass cannot be pinpointed because it depends on the specific densities of the Toro limestone and mortar used to build the structure, I am assuming a mean of 2.6 tons per cubic meter and hence a total mass of about 6.75 million tons. People are able to convert about 20% of food, energy into useful work, and for hard-working men that amounts to about 440 kilojoules a day. Lifting the stones would thus require about 5.5 million labor days, 2.4 trillion divided by 440,000, or about 275,000 days a year during the 20-year period, and about 900 people could deliver that by working 10 hours a day for 300 days a year. A similar number of workers might be needed to emplace the stones in the rising structure and then smooth the cladding blocks, in contrast. Many interior blocks were just rough cut. And in order to cut 2.6 million cubic meters of stone in 20 years, the project would have required about 1,500 quarrymen working 300 days per year and producing 0.25 cubic meters of stone per capita by using copper chisels and olerite mallets. The grand total of the construction labor would then be some 3,300 workers. Even if we were to double that in order to account for designers, organizers, and overseers, and for the labor needed for transport, repair of tools, the building and maintaining of on-site housing, and cooking and clothes washing, the total would be still fewer than 7,000 workers. During the time of the pyramid's construction, the total population of Egypt was 1.5 to 1.6 million people, and hence the deployed force of less than 10,000 would not have amounted to any extraordinary imposition on the country's economy. The challenge would have been to organize the labor, to plan an uninterrupted supply of building stones, including the granite for internal structures, particularly the central chamber and the massive corbelled grand gallery, that had to be delivered by boats from southern Egypt some 800 kilometers from Giza, and to provide housing, clothing, and food for labor gangs on site. In the 1990s, archaeologists uncovered a cemetery for workers as well as the foundations of a settlement used to house the builders of the two later pyramids at Giza, indicating that no more than 20,000 people lived at the site. The rapid sequence of building two additional pyramids, for Kafr, Khufu's son, starting in 2520 BCE, and for Menkor, starting in 2490 BCE is the best testimony to the fact that pyramid building had been mastered to such a degree that the erection of those massive structures became just another set of construction projects for the old kingdom's designers, managers, and workers. Why unemployment figures do not tell the whole story many economic statistics are, notoriously unreliable, and the reason often has to do with what is included in the measurement and what is left out. Gross domestic product offers a good example of a measure that leaves out key environmental externalities such as air and water pollution, soil erosion, biodiversity loss, and the effects of climate change. Unemployed men lining up for food during the Great Depression measuring, unemployment is also an exercise in exclusion, and the choices are perhaps best illustrated with detailed data from the United States. Casual consumers of U.S. economic news will be familiar only with the official figure, which put the country's total unemployment at 3.5% in December 2019. But that is just one of six different methods used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to quantify labor, underutilization. Here they are, in ascending order, with rates, again, for December 2019. People unemployed 15 weeks or longer as a share of the civilian labor force, 1.2%. People who lost jobs and who completed temporary jobs, 1.6%. Total unemployment as a share of the civilian labor force, the official rate, 3.5%. Total unemployed plus discouraged workers, those no longer looking for a job, as a share of the civilian labor force and discouraged workers. 3.7%. The previous category enlarged by all people only marginally attached, doing temporary or occasional work, 
to the labor force, 4.2%. And finally, the last category plus those who work only part-time for economic reasons, that is, they would prefer to work full-time, 6.7%. These, six measures present quite a spread of values, the official unemployment rate, U3, was only about half of the most encompassing rate, U6, which was more than five times as high as the narrowest measure, U1. If you lose your job, you count as unemployed only if you keep looking for a new one, otherwise, you never get counted again. That is why, when trying to get closer to the real, unemployment rate, you must look at the labor force participation rate, the number of people available for work as a percentage of the total population which has recently been in decline. In 1950 the U.S. rate was only about 59%, and after mostly rising for half a century it peaked at 67.3% during the spring of 2000, the subsequent decline brought it to 62.5% by the fall of 2005, and this was followed by a slow rise to 632 by the end of 2019. There are, of course, substantial differences among age groups. The highest rate is about 90%, for men between 35 and 44 years of age. And European unemployment figures show how difficult it is to relate them to a country's social fabric or to its inhabitants' personal satisfaction. The lowest rate, at just above 2%, is in the Czech Republic, while Spain has endured years of high unemployment, more than 26% in 2013 and more than 14% in late 2019 for the entire population, and, even after declining a bit, still about 33% for Spanish youth in 2019, the latter figure clearly a depressing reality for anybody entering the labor force. And yet the Czech happiness score, see the, following chapter, is only 8% ahead of the Spanish one, and the Czech suicide rate is at just over 8 per 100,000, three times as high as in Spain. True, robberies are more common in Barcelona than in Prague, but the Spanish mean is only slightly higher than the British mean, and British unemployment is a quarter of the Spanish rate. Obviously, complex realities of, unemployment can never, be caught by an aggregate number. Many people who have been formally unemployed have coped thanks to family support and informal labor arrangements. Many who are fully employed are unhappy with their lot but cannot change jobs easily or at all, because of their skills or family circumstances. Numbers may not lie, but individual perceptions of them differ. What makes people happy? To answer that, question, it would be very helpful to know which societies actually consider themselves significantly happier than others, and, since 2012, this is as easy as consulting the latest edition of the World Happiness Report, now published annually in New York by the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. In 2019, summing up data and surveys from 2016 to 18, Finland was the world's happiest country for the second time in a row, followed by Denmark, Norway, and Iceland, the Netherlands and Switzerland came just ahead of Sweden which means that the Nordic nations took five of the top seven spots. The top ten were rounded out by New Zealand, Canada, and Austria. The second group of ten started with Australia and ended with the Czech Republic, the UK was number 15, Germany number, 17, and the US squeezed in at number 19. This is what gets reported in the media, admiring the ever-happy Nordics and pointing out how America's, badly distributed riches cannot buy happiness. What rarely gets reported is what actually goes into constructing these national scores, GDP per capita, social support, determined by asking if, when in trouble, people have relatives or friends to count, on, healthy life expectancy, taken from the World Health Organization's assessment of 100 different health factors, freedom to make life choices scored by answering the question are you satisfied or dissatisfied with your freedom to choose what you do with your life? Generosity, have you donated money to a charity in the past month? And perceptions of corruption, throughout the, government and within business. As with all indices, this one contains a mix of components, including, a notoriously questionable indicator, national GDP converted to US dollars, answers that cannot be easily compared across cultures, 
perception of freedom to choose, and scores based on objective and revealing variables, healthy life expectancy. This mail on Jalone indicates that there should be a great deal of skepticism regarding any precise ranking. And this feeling is mightily reinforced when one looks closely at what never gets reported in the media, the actual country scores, accurate to the third decimal digit. By coincidence, in 2019 I lectured in all of the world's three happiest countries, but, obviously, I was not able to notice that the Finns, 7.769, are 2.2% happier, than the Danes, 7.600 who in turn are 0.6% happier than the Norwegians. The absurdity of all of this is obvious. Even 9th place Canada has a combined score that is just 6.3% lower than Finland's. Given all the inherent uncertainties regarding the constituent variables and their simplistic, unweighted addition, would it not be more accurate, more honest, and, of course, less, worthy of media attention, to at least round the scores to the nearest unit? Or, better yet, do no individual ranking and just say which 10 or 20 countries make up the top group? And then there is that remarkable lack of correlation between happiness and suicide. Plotting the two variables for all European countries shows a complete absence of a relationship. Indeed, some of the happiest countries have relatively high suicide rates, and some rather unhappy places have a very low frequency of suicide. But what? besides being Nordic and rich, makes people happy. Fascinating clues are provided by countries whose ranking appears out of place. That Afghanistan, the Central African Republic, and South Sudan are the three least happy countries of the 156 ranked nations is, sadly, quite expected, civil wars have been destroying them for far too long. But 23 are D-place Mexico a narco state with an extraordinarily high rate of violence and murder, ahead of France? Guatemala ahead of Saudi Arabia? Panama ahead of Italy? Colombia ahead of Kuwait? Argentina ahead of Japan? And Ecuador ahead of South Korea? Clearly, these pairs form a remarkable pattern, their second members are richer, often, vastly so, more stable, less violent and offer a considerably easier life than the first countries of every bear, whose commonalities are obvious, they may be relatively poor, troubled, and even violent, but they are all former Spanish colonies and hence overwhelmingly Catholic. And all of them are in the top 50, Ecuador is in the 50th spot, well ahead of Japan, 58, and far ahead of China, 93. The country that has been seen by naive Westerners as a veritable, economic paradise full of happy shoppers. But while Louis Vuitton may be making a bundle in China, neither the massive malls nor the leadership of the all-knowing party make the Chinese happy, even the citizens of dysfunctional and much poorer Nigeria, 85, feel happier. The lessons are clear, if you cannot fit into the top 10, not being Nordic, Dutch, Swiss, Kiwi, or Canadian, convert to Catholicism and start learning Castellano. Inverted exclamation mark Buna Seward Conesso. The rise of Megacity's modernity means many things, rising affluence and mobility, inexpensive and instant communication, an abundance of affordable food, longer life expectancy, but an extraterrestrial observer sending periodic reconnaissance probes to Earth would be impressed by a shift easily observable from space, the increasing pace of urbanization as cities keep encroaching, amoeba-like on the surrounding countryside, creating massive blobs of intense light throughout the night. In 1800, less than 2% of the world's population lived in cities, by 1900 the share was still only about 5%. By 1950 it had reached 30%, and 2007 became the first year when more than half of humanity lived in cities. By 2016, the United Nations Comprehensive Survey found 512 cities with a population greater than 1 million, with 45 of them larger than 5 million and 31 surpassing 10 million. This largest group has a special name, Mergacities. This continued concentration of humanity in ever larger cities has been driven by advantages arising from the agglomeration of people, knowledge, and activities, often due to collocation of kindred companies. On the global level, think of London and New York, the financial capitals, 
and of Shenzhen in China's Guangdong province, the capital of consumer electronics. Economies of scale bring many savings, interactions between producers, suppliers, and consumers are easier to handle, businesses have access to large pools of labor and diverse expertise, and, despite, their crowding and environmental problems, the quality of life in large cities attracts talent, now often from all over the world. Cities are places of countless synergies and investment opportunities, and they offer superior educations and rewarding careers. This is why many smaller cities, much like the surrounding countryside, are losing population, but megacities keep growing. Ranking them by size is not straightforward, because assorted administrative boundaries yield different numbers than when the megacities are considered as functional units. Tokyo, the world's largest megacity, has eight different jurisdictional or statistical definitions, from the 23 wards of the old city, with fewer than 10 million people, to the national capital region area with nearly 45 million. The one used by the city administration is the Tokyo Major Metropolitan Region, Tokyo Daitoshiken which is defined by commuting access within 70 kilometers of the city's massive Twin Tower Metropolitan Government Building, Tokyo Tacho, in Shinjuku, the region now has some 39 million people. The growth of megacities offers a perfect illustration of receding Western influence and the rise of Asia. In 1900, nine of the world's ten largest cities were in Europe and the United States. In 1950 New York and Tokyo were the only megacities, and the third, Mexico City, was added in 1975. But by the centuries in the list had grown to 18 megacities, and by 2020 it reached 35 with a total of more than half a billion inhabitants. Tokyo, with more people than Canada, and generating economic product equal to about, half of the German total, remains at the top and 20 out of the 35 megacities, nearly 60%, are in Asia. There are 6 in Latin America, 2 in Europe, Moscow and Paris, 3 in Africa, Cairo, Lagos, Kinshasa, and 2 in North America, New York and Los Angeles. None of them ranks high on all major quality of life criteria, Tokyo is clean, its residential area is not far from the city, center are remarkably quiet public transportation is exemplary, and the crime rate is very low, but housing is cramped and daily commutes are long and taxing. Chinese megacities, all built by migrants from rural areas who, until recently, were denied the right to live there, have become displays of new architecture and shiny public projects, but they have poor air and water quality and their inhabitants are now incessantly monitored for the slightest social infractions. In contrast, Few rules prevail in African megacities, and Lagos and Kinshasa are the very embodiments of disorganization, squalor, and environmental decay. But all that makes little difference, each megacity, no matter if it is Tokyo, with the largest number of starred restaurants, New York, with the highest share of, population born abroad, or Rio de Janeiro, with a murder rate approaching 40 per 100,000 continues to attract people and the United Nations has forecast the emergence of 10 additional megacities by 2030, 6 in Asia, including India's on